Hey everyone, here we are today. Today I want to talk to you about evolution. I know we got a different look to the lesson here, um, trying to make this lesson a little bit different. So um, trying to kind of cover some different topics, but today we're going to be talking about evolution and I could spend hours talking about evolution and evolution is one of the, the big unifying topics that I love to talk about in this class. Um, but what I'm going to do right now is kind of go through basic organismal evolution on the planet and actually how the planet evolved to be the way it is today to support life, which is actually really under important to understand is that the way the planet is right now has not always been this way. So I really want to take some time with you right now to go through it. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to leave the center of your screen here. I'm going to mosey on down to the corner and then uh, we'll be able to get on with this lesson. So here we go. All right. So now that we're down in the corner here, um, I can kind of continue on talking all about uh, evolution. So without further ado, let me dive right in. Now, big things to understand about this is that the Earth is very old. All right. Earth is how old? Well, the Earth whoop, is 4.6 billion years old. 4.6 billion years old. And in that 4.6 billion years, we've been going through some immense changes. Now, the one thing I want you to understand is if we looked at like a timeline from, you know, start of Earth. So the very beginning of the Earth, what was it like? Well, the very beginning Earth was just a lot of molten uh, rock material. And you had a bunch of uh, celestial bodies smashing into each other and gravity started to eventually pull things together. And as they went around the Earth, sun at a certain distance, this distance we are away from the sun, about 92, 93 million miles away from the sun. All those uh, objects in the way start to accumulate and continue to smash into the earth. So it was very, very hot. And the heat and the energy from the collisions created this hot molten earth material. Then eventually it started to cool down. And it took approximately a billion years for this to happen. But as the Earth started to cool down, water started to condense out of the atmosphere. So water would condense out of the atmosphere, flow over the rocks, and eventually dissolve a lot of phosphates, nitrates, and various other um, salts into the water. And then it would kind of collect in these very, very shallow seas. These shallow seas, very, very hot still, bubbling with, you know, earthen lava or like not really lava but earthen bubbling goop uh material that is what we refer to as the primordial soup now there's two major theories on the origin of life one is from this primordial soup where you have this nutrient rich uh solution and what's happening is that you have um, a lot of heat a lot of energy a lot of sulfur and chemosynthesis can kind of take place. And so organisms can uh, kind of get their energy from there. The other theory is that with those shallow oceans, you had um, photosynthetic life forms taking place. So we don't know. These are all theories on the uh, evolution of life. But the understanding that, you know, we don't know exactly where life came from, but we know that there is life on the earth now. And it had to get there some time. But the, over the first billion years of the earth, there was no life. The big thing to understand is that you just had these nasty, nasty conditions um, that no life really wanted to exist in. There's no ozone layer. There's no atmospheric oxygen. There's no um, really, there's no vegetation. There's barely, there's no soils. There's no organic matter for soils to form. It is just literally molten rock, volcanic eruptions, horrible breathing conditions, a lot of uh, nitrogen in the air, a lot of methane, a lot of acid in the air. So really just the worst possible conditions to survive in. And then we have to figure out how did we get our first life forms to exist? And this is a very hard topic for a lot of people to understand this fathomable jump of how did we get the first life to exist? And there's a very famous experiment by two scientists. It's called the Miller Ure experiment. Uh, Stanley Miller and Harold Urey, I believe, out of the University of Denver, University of Colorado, one of the two. Uh, what they did is they created an enclosed system here. And this is a picture kind of showing you the enclosed system. And what you see is this chamber up here is really the most important. 
what they did is they created and they sealed within this uh, experiment only gases found in that primitive Earth. So take a look at what gases they have here. CH4, methane, NH3, ammonia, water vapor, and hydrogen gas. And what they did is they ran two electrodes in here to simulate lightning. And so they would create these lightning bolts and lightning shocks. But these things right here have all the building blocks of organic molecules. And so what started to happen is they put all these inorganic things in here. They heated up the water. So they had a heating element, which created steam, water vapor, which then transferred around. And eventually it would just interact with these electrodes. Again, simulating lightning to occur. And eventually over time, they would sample it from the trap. And what they found were amino acids. They created organic molecules from these inorganic compounds. That's important. That's incredibly important to understand. Think about that. In a short time period of running this experiment, they were able to identify amino acids. Now, the early Earth was going through the same experiment over a billion years. So is it fathomable to believe that in this primordial soup, we could spawn amino acids and then maybe the first proteins and the idea of microspheres and coacervates and eventually lead to the first very, very basic organismal life? It is a fathomable jump. And that's what I want you to understand. Yes, I know there is a lot of religious implications here, um, but from a purely scientific standpoint, this is what we are looking at. This is the evidence we have that evolution is taking place. So over the next billion years, with all of these really, really harsh conditions occurring, here is what we have. We eventually lead that primordial soup spawns our first proto cells, proto referring to pre cells like they weren't the true uh, nucleus based cells you see now. And the nucleus obviously occurs within a eukaryotic cell um, is a very, very late evolutionary thing to occur. But this is the first early Earth. Again, no atmospheric oxygen. Big deal. No ozone layer. So the ultraviolet radiation is really, really uh, deadly. So a lot of the organisms are all found inside of the ocean. All life is in the ocean right now. They're protected by the ocean waters. And what starts to happen is you eventually get simple archaea bacteria life forms. Sometimes we'll refer to them as colonial organisms in that they lived in colonies. So in this picture right here, you see these structures, these little uh, rock-esque structures, and they are a very, very famous organism in the history of the Earth, and they're called stromatolites. And if you look up stromatolites, you'll see that their fossilized remains are, can be found today, especially in places like Australia and whatnot, but they fell, they formed in these very, very shallow oceans, these colonial organisms that were able to survive you know, off the nutrients in the primordial soup waters, these very early shallow oceans. Now, um, this is a TED talk that I'll have you guys watch on your own. Um, if you do a quick little Google search or YouTube search for the mysterious origins of life on Earth, it talks about the idea of black smokers and primordial soup and how do we get the first cells on the planet. It's a short little five minute um, video that I would highly recommend you guys check out. Now, we've created very, very simple life, and then we create the most important organism in the history of the earth, and that is cyanobacteria, also known as blue-green algae. So cyanobacteria, also known as blue-green algae, is incredibly important because this is one of those first photosynthetic organisms, and we know that one of the byproducts of photosynthesis is oxygen. So now, all of a sudden, we have a process that's going to create oxygen on the planet. And that oxygen, again, these algae are in the water, but there's a massive exchange of gases occurring between the oceans and the atmosphere. So what's happening is the gases are leaving the atmosphere, or leaving the ocean, going up into the atmosphere, and eventually changing the Earth's atmosphere. So what happens is oxygen, I know it's going to be hard to see, leaves the water, eventually reacts with the high-level ultraviolet radiation, 
to form a free radical oxygen, which will then bond with an O2 to yield O3. I know all this seems really confusing and whatnot, but this is the molecule that is incredibly important, O3. O3 is ozone. Now what happens is that ozone formed at the surface of the Earth is going to just naturally work its way up into the Earth's atmosphere. And over the next so many, over the next billion years, what is actually going to happen is our ozone layer is going to start to form. When we get our ozone layer to form, now organisms are protected from that harmful mutagen of ultraviolet radiation. So they can now leave the oceans if they wanted to. So organisms start to kind of move up onto land. Uh, first thing you're going to get are a lot of your intertidal pool organisms, so things that survive between high tide and low tide. These are very, very primitive organisms that can withstand being dried out. And then what eventually starts to happen is very, very simple organisms like mosses, for example, or algae start to kind of colonize land and they create then soil. And then from there, once you have soil, different evolutionary changes are going to happen. And all of a sudden, more and more advanced organisms start to appear on the planet. And we start to go through these evolutionary explosions where all of a sudden now we have so many different organisms that can survive because the abiotic conditions are allowing them to thrive. The cyanobacteria, why do I consider it to be the most important organism in the history of the Earth? Because it took the Earth's atmosphere from zero parts per million oxygen up to about 21% oxygen. That is incredible. It has had the biggest impact on the atmosphere of the Earth. Yes, I know humans have had a very, very big impact. Nothing in the way of uh, the impact that cyanobacteria have had on the surface of the Earth. Now, over the next billion years, again, we have all that cyanobacteria continually developing. The archaea bacteria are developing. But then we get our first uh, eukaryotic life to appear through the endosymbiote theory. So the idea that there are all these archaea bacteria, these prokaryotic life forms like mitochondria and chloroplasts, which used to be their own separate organisms, all of a sudden are engulfed within a larger cell and they start to live together. That's why if you ever read in some of your biology classes, you heard that mitochondria had their own DNA and chloroplasts have their own DNA because they were once their own organisms. So they have their own uh, genetic information because they were all independent. Then the endosymbiotic theory is the idea that you had these organisms that you know evolved to live within one another. And over then the next 500 million years, uh, you're going to have massive amounts of genetic recombination through sexual reproduction, uh, the, the transfer of genetic information, and then diversity just starts to take off. So the evolutionary diversity really starts to balloon about 500 million years ago. 500 million years ago. Think about that. The history of the Earth is 4.6 billion years old, but only about 500 million years ago did we really see life diversify for, in the eukaryotic realm. Uh, which is just mind-boggling to me. Now, I know it is still also 500 million years ago, which is a long time period if you think about it, but in the scheme of the Earth, it's really not that long. So then what has happened over the last little bit? The Cambrian explosion, where we saw an immense amount of diversity occurring inside the oceans, uh, just pure amounts of life all over the place, diversified and appearing all over. 450 million years ago, we start to see our invertebrates, especially in the water. Okay, we're not talking about insects yet. Insects don't appear on the planet. There's a lot of the terrestrial organisms don't appear yet. 400 million years ago was the age of fishes. Fish diversity was at its greatest. All of a sudden, organisms starting to evolve to be advanced. Um, then 345 million years ago, we start to see forests appearing. Now, these are not forests like we think of today. When we think of forests, we're thinking of like the major trees like oaks and maples and whatnot. Uh, that's not what we saw back uh, 345 million years ago. These were a lot of ginkgo or ferns, pteridophytes, uh, specialized organisms that were not evolved. Uh, they were big. They were massive forests and a lot like club mosses that were, you know, multiple meters high. Um, but they were not flowering trees. They were not, they didn't have a, tr a great vascular system. They were able to survive because the humidity on the planet was so high. The temperature was so high. So they were able to thrive still. Then eventually we see insects appear 340 million years ago. Reptiles then appear after insects. 
Then dinosaurs start to appear. Now here, let's start to put some of these things in order. Reptiles are first, all right? And then eventually reptiles start to diversify. Reptiles go to become uh, amphibians and also birds. So birds start to appear. Um, it's really important to understand that. Uh, then eventually 65 million years ago, all the dinosaurs appeared, you know, the extinction of the dinosaurs. Uh, 60 million years ago, we start to see our first flowering plants, our angiosperms. These are now all the flowers. If I asked you to name a plant right now, 99% of the plants you would name would be angiosperms. The only ones that you're probably thinking are not angiosperms are going to be ginkgo trees. And actually, I think ginkgo trees, they might be their own angiosperms, but I was thinking more specifically conifers. Conifers are not um, angiosperms. They are gymnosperms. A big difference there. Mammals don't appear until about 25 million years ago. Three million years ago, the first hominids appear. You know, things like Lucy, uh, the first hominid or one of the most basic hominid fossils we have appeared. And then modern humans don't really appear until about, you know, 100,000 years ago. And ever since, we've kind of been developing the planet, uh, especially over the past last 2,000 years. Now, what has put the pressure on things to evolve? And this is something I really want you to make sure you know. You should know this from biology, but I really want to make sure this point is driven home. There are two types of selections for organisms to survive, natural selection and artificial selection. Natural selection is exactly what it sounds like, a natural process to allow organisms to survive. This is a process that's going to remove weaker individuals. It's going to remove organisms that do not have proper adaptations to survive. And it also might give benefit to organisms that are born with mutations that are favorable. A favorable mutation is just an adaptation. So these organisms get the better chance to survive. And if it's genetically linked, that adaptation or that mutation is beneficial and it's genetically linked, then those organisms are going to go on to reproduce more. They're going to be considered fitter. And remember, we talk about the most simplest definition of evolution is survival of the fittest. Well, what we're talking about is the reproductively best adapted. Compare natural selection now to artificial selection. Artificial selection is what humans do. Artificial selection, humans breed certain organisms so that they have traits that are favorable for humans. Think of all the different dog breeds on the planet. Think of all the different chicken breeds on the planet, all the different cow breeds on the planet. They've all been bred to be that way for human profits. That's it. It's for money. It's not because we're making a stronger evolutionary organism. It's for money. Think about this. If you had a cow that produced more milk, that's awesome because then you could sell more milk. Does that benefit the cow? It's going to have all this extra weight. It's going to need to eat all this extra food. It's going to produce all this extra milk. Is that an evolutionary advantage to that cow? No, it's not. But from a human standpoint, you want to breed cows that produce more milk because now all of a sudden you're going to be able to make more profit off of it. So hopefully you're kind of can see the difference between uh, natural selection and artificial selection. Now, this is the last thing I really want to talk about, the different types of natural selection. There's three different types, stabilizing selection, directional selection, and disruptive selection. Oops, sorry, let me go back real quick. Disruptive selection. What you have here, and this is what we're going to base everything off, is this first chart up top. You have mice, and this is just showing their different phenotypical variations of color of their fur. So here you have a bell curve showing the population. The bell curve shows that the bulk of the population is right here in the middle, all right, where a lower percentage is going to be on the outer skirt, uh, the outer amount. So a very, very light colored mouse to a very, very dark colored mouse. Now, what this means maybe is that through their normal predation and whatnot, the very light colored and the very dark colored have equal chance of death. And if you're kind of an average colored mouse, you have a greater chance of survival. Maybe it's the habitat you live in, their fur color blends in, who knows what. Okay, so this is our initial population. Now, in stabilizing selection, what is going to happen is that there's going to be pressure applied to the outside variances. So those outlier data points, the normalized or the median phenotype is going to be preserved. So what starts to happen is now the curve changes and becomes what we call more stabilized or more specific. So stabilizing selection is almost like a specific phenotype. The average phenotype is favored in this situation. Directional selection. In directional selection, there's a pressure on one 
type of phenotype. So maybe the light one is preyed upon. And what starts to happen is the light one becomes less and less frequent. So that frequency of sightings kind of shifts. It shifts to one direction. So you see how the curve kind of skews a little bit more. So the darker colored mice in directional selection in this sample are favored more than the light colored. And therefore, they become more populous in the overall population. In disruptive stabilization what's, or selection, what's going to happen is that there's pressure applied on the normal or the average phenotype. And what it does is it kind of splits the population into two. So what happened is what was once a uniform blending of colors is now disruptive right in the middle. And so what you start to get is two distinctly different populations. Now, are they different species? No. Okay, they're just two different populations. Now, if they continue to breed within the same population over a couple, many, many, many generations, maybe they will eventually become so genetically different that they are no longer able to survive uh, or no longer breed together. So they are considered then separate species. So here's just another look at those different three types of natural selection, uh, just so you can kind of see which ones are favored. If you kind of need a little help with that, I'll gladly go over it. And with that, I kind of finished this brief little talk about, you know, evolution on the planet and specifically the different types of natural selection. I know it's a little bit different format. Hope it wasn't too bad for you. And uh, I hope, you know, this is satisfies your thirst for knowledge, uh, especially on the evolutionary uh, topics. So with that, I thank you for checking in and I look forward to seeing you at the next lesson. Have a great day, everybody. You like that lesson? I know you did. So why don't you go ahead and smash that like button right now. Go ahead and comment. Tell all your friends about how great that lesson was. And make sure you subscribe because I'm going to keep bringing you AP environmental content that you're going to want to watch or do whatever else those other YouTube channels tell you to do. And with that, Maloney, out.